Hi, listeners. Just a quick reminder that starting in August, Cults is moving exclusively to Spotify. Being a part of the Spotify family means that we're able to bring you more in-depth and exciting content than ever before. And we can't wait for you to check it out. Mystery, manipulation, murder. Don't miss any of it. All you have to do is download the Spotify app for free and search Cults. Give it a follow and start enjoying. That's it. We can't thank you enough for listening to Cults. And we look forward to seeing you exclusively on Spotify in August. Due to the graphic nature of this cult's crimes, listener discretion is advised. This episode includes discussions of drug use and abuse that some people may find offensive. We advise extreme caution for children under 13. On a bright afternoon in 1971, a young man wandered down Hollywood Boulevard. He hadn't eaten in days. All he wanted was a safe place to rest. As he approached the corner of Hollywood and Highland Avenue, a group of missionaries immediately swarmed around him. Was he in search of meaning? Had he heard the apocalypse was nigh? Did he need something to eat? The man didn't know what they were talking about, but he definitely needed something to eat. Before he could say anything else, the man was shepherded onto a huge red, white, and blue bus. On the back was written... The world is coming to an end. The bus drove him an hour outside of Los Angeles to an enormous compound. The missionaries talked the whole way. They promised communal living and spiritual enrichment. Of course, meals were provided for those who worked. It only took a few days of hard farm labor for the man to realize he had been duped. But by then, he had donated his last dime to the church. He had no way out of the compound, and he was too afraid to ask the bus to take him home. He was trapped. Hi, I'm Greg Polson. And I'm Vanessa Richardson. And this is Cults, a ParCast original. Every Tuesday, we take a look at a cult's practices, their leader, and their followers— Today, we're taking a deep dive into the Alamo Christian Foundation, founded by Tony and Susan Alamo. Their evangelical sermons drew in hundreds of followers between 1969 and 2008. At ParCast, we're grateful for you, our listeners. You allow us to do what we love. Let us know how we're doing. Reach out on Facebook and Instagram at ParCast and Twitter at ParCast Network. And if you enjoyed today's episode, the best way to help us is to leave a five-star review wherever you're listening. It really does help. We also now have merchandise. Head to parcast.com slash merch for more information. You can listen to previous episodes of Cults, as well as all of Parcast's other shows on Spotify or wherever you listen to podcasts. A new episode comes out every Tuesday. Tony and Susan Alamo founded the Alamo Christian Foundation in Hollywood, California in 1969. Tony, aged 35, had previously been an aspiring lounge singer and music promoter, while Susan was a 44-year-old wannabe actress. After a whirlwind romance, the pair found a passion for scamming the less fortunate on the streets of Hollywood. By 2008, their cult had grown exponentially. At its height, over 800 people were part of the foundation. Their network of fervent missionaries operated farms, churches, and even retail outlets, including Nashville's largest Western clothing store. As the foundation expanded, its practices grew more extreme until eventually they became illegal. In 2008, the cult's compound was raided by the FBI in connection to an investigation into child sex trafficking. This week, we'll focus on the early lives of Tony and Susan Alamo, as well as the growth of the cult from just a few individuals to over 100 followers. In part two, we'll broaden our focus to the increasingly dangerous practices of the Alamo Christian Foundation. We'll learn how Tony and Susan took their organization nationwide and how the FBI uncovered the cult's criminal activities. Tony Alamo was born Bernie Laser Hoffman in Joplin, Missouri, on September 20th, 1934. His parents were Jewish immigrants from Romania. After experiencing rampant anti-Semitism in Europe, they warned Tony and his two brothers to keep their Jewish ancestry a secret. 
Tony's father worked as a dancer and choreographer. His mother stayed at home, but sometimes took odd jobs when money was tight, which was often. While Tony was still young, sometime in the 1940s, the family moved to Helena, Montana. Not much is known about his early years, but it is clear that Tony was an extroverted, outgoing boy. He didn't put much effort into school, but had a powerful ambition. He didn't know exactly how he was going to do it, but Tony wanted to be rich and famous. He often rode his bike through the suburban streets on his paper route, daydreaming about leaving the stifling small town behind. He told anyone who would listen that one day he was going to move to California and be a big star. His desire to be in show business only grew as he got older, but his plans to leave Montana were sidetracked when he fell in love with Joanne Dill. They married soon after meeting in 1952, when Tony was 18. The couple had three children together, Corey, Mike, and Maureen. During this time, they stayed in Montana and got by with help from their parents. Tony loved Joanne, but realized after they were married that she didn't want the same life he did. He became restless, unable to suppress his desire to leave Montana forever and move to Hollywood. His latest plan to hit it big was to become a famous singer, like his favorite star, Dean Martin. He loved Martin's cocky charm and wealth. Tony honed his crooning voice at small venues around Helena, singing popular big band music. Unfortunately, despite his best efforts, Tony's voice was described as unimpressive and unpolished by managers and club owners he tried to woo. Despite a mediocre voice and only weak encouragement from his family and friends, Tony still believed he was destined to be a famous performer. His rabid ambition and inflated ego blinded him to his own limited talent. Vanessa's going to take over on the psychology here and throughout the episode. Please note, Vanessa is not a licensed psychologist or psychiatrist, but she has done a lot of research for this show. Thanks, Greg. Tony may have fallen victim to a psychological phenomenon known as the Dunning-Kruger effect. According to Dr. David B. Feldman, professor of psychology at Santa Clara University, psychologists show empirically that the least competent people often believe they are among the most competent. Unskilled people lack the skill necessary to evaluate their own skill. So Tony's lack of talent actually made him more certain he had the ability to leave his small town behind and become a famous singer. It's a common phenomenon. With an untrained voice and an abundance of confidence, he was unaware of his own shortcomings. As Dr. Feldman said, judging one's competence requires something that psychologists call metacognitive skill, the ability to examine one's own thoughts. Most of us lack the metacognitive skill necessary to accurately judge our performance. Convinced of his talent, Tony divorced Joanne in 1955 in Cleveland, Ohio, soon after his third child, Maureen, was born. It is unclear why the couple decided to travel for their divorce. Following the split, he continued to sing around Montana and squirrel away money until he could afford to move and chase his dreams. In 1960, at the age of 26, he took the plunge and moved to Los Angeles. It was there that he would meet the love of his life and partner in crime, Susan. Susan Alamo's early life paralleled Tony's in many ways. She was born Edith Opal Horn on April 25, 1925, in the rural town of Alma, Arkansas. Her father worked at a canning factory for 12 hours or more each day to provide for the family. Like Tony, Susan was uninterested in school. She was sociable and popular. She made friends easily and loved to go out on weekends. She was also beautiful. Her own daughter said later, Susan was beautiful in the weirdest way, not like you would look at her and go, wow, a striking beauty. But when she walked in a room, she had so much command that people stopped talking. As long as she could remember, Susan dreamed of being a movie star. But she put her dreams on hold, much like Tony, for high school romance. In 1939, at the age of 14, she married a boy from her class. The next year, she gave birth to a son. In 1941, at the age of 16, 
her marriage ended in divorce. Thoroughly disillusioned with life in Arkansas, Susan's dreams of fame and fortune resurfaced after her marriage ended. She left her family and son behind and moved to California at the age of 16. Susan was determined to remake herself in Los Angeles. She changed her name from Edith Opal to Susan Fleetwood and threw herself into acting, despite little money, few prospects, and no experience or talent to speak of. She auditioned for movies and plays and took singing lessons, but never scored much more than a few small gigs at seedy local bars. Throughout the 1940s, it took all Susan had just to keep her head above water. She often called her family back in Arkansas. They sent her whatever money they could, but begged for her to come home. Still, no matter how hard things became, Susan refused to go back. She was convinced she had what it took, She always felt she was on the verge of making it big, but money and fame remained just out of reach. Her overconfidence, like Tony's, caused her to ignore many of her problems. She spent money as soon as she got it, because she always expected her big break to be around the corner. She thought she was already a great talent, and so refused to take acting lessons or spend time practicing or singing. One of the biggest problems with overconfidence is that it causes people to underestimate the difficulty of a task. Psychology professor Bobby Hoffman wrote, Proper calibration of ability must be demonstrated even when we believe we know a task inside and out. Overcalibrating ability may result in exerting limited effort because we think a task is easy. By 1950, 25-year-old Susan was at the end of her rope. She still hadn't found fame, and was oftentimes unable to afford an apartment, reduced to couch surfing. But later that year, she met Saul Lipowitz. He was a strong man with ties to the mob, but was also attractive, charming, and had a place to stay. He and Susan hit it off and were married in late 1950. Their marriage was not a happy one. Saul was unambitious and didn't support Susan's acting dreams. Instead, he insisted she drive him around the city to mob jobs and do other menial jobs for him while he worked. After a few months, Susan became pregnant. In 1951, she gave birth to a daughter, who now goes by Chris. Saul and Susan had trouble providing enough money for the child, and after her birth, they argued more often than before. They separated less than a year later. It was just Susan and Chris after that. On the verge of ending up on the street, Susan accepted charity from a church and converted from Judaism to evangelical Christianity in the mid-1950s. With the help of the church, she started to teach Sunday school and preach, though she was never ordained officially. After honing her skills at the pulpit, Susan decided to put them to use for some quick cash. In 1960, when she was 35, she found a new way to make ends meet when money was especially tight. She dressed Chris in rags and took her to different local churches. During Sunday service, she would wait for a quiet point during the sermon. Then she would suddenly stand and pronounce, I have a message from the Lord and I need to speak. With all eyes on her, Susan gave the congregation a heart-wrenching story. The details varied, but she always described herself as a missionary seeking funds to travel and spread the word of the Lord. After her speech, her daughter, clad in a shabby dress, would sing a hymn in a lilting voice. Almost always, the churchgoers were so touched, they would pass around the collection plate to help the brave messengers of God. On a good day, Susan could earn up to $100 from charitable Christians. These cons helped Susan keep her head above water, but they also helped her develop her persona as a pious, strong-willed Christian woman. She was constantly polishing her sob stories to achieve the right mix of humble neediness and uplifting confidence in the Lord. Despite the success of her scams, life was still difficult for Susan and her daughter. They lived in a one-bedroom apartment with a pull-out bed. On Saturdays, they bought unlabeled cans cheap from grocery stores and ate whatever was inside. Susan hadn't totally given up on her dreams of being a star, but by now she'd become bitter and desperate, willing to do whatever it took to get her big break. 
Coming up, Bernie Hoffman arrives in Los Angeles to begin his new life as aspiring musician, Tony Alamo. Every so often, something so impactful happens, it has the power to capture the attention of a whole country. An event so deadly or dumbfounding, it has no choice but to live on in infamy. Hi, Parcasters. It's Ashley Flowers, and I'm exposing the most sinister cases from the darkest corners of the globe in my new true crime limited series, International Infamy. Every Tuesday, come along as I guide you on a wicked world tour. 15 different countries, 15 infamous crimes. Take a trip to Iceland, where six people confessed to a murder that never actually happened. Journey to Mexico, where a Lucha Libre wrestler moonlights as a serial killer. And travel to New Zealand, where two friends hatch a deadly plan to become famous. Each episode of International Infamy explores the twists and turns of a notoriously high-profile case, zeroing in on the cultural details which make the crime unique to its location, and explaining why it couldn't have happened anywhere else. Follow my new Spotify original from ParCast, International Infamy with Ashley Flowers, and catch a new episode every week. Listen free on Spotify or wherever you get your podcasts. Now, back to the story. In 1960, while 35-year-old Susan Fleetwood was struggling to keep food on the table for her daughter, 26-year-old Tony had just arrived in Los Angeles. Like Susan, Tony's first priority was reinventing himself. He changed his name from Bernie Hoffman to Marcus Abad. When that didn't catch on, he changed it again to Mark Hoffman, before finally landing on Tony Alamo. Since there were many popular Italian-American singers at the time, like Tony Bennett and Perry Como, he thought that an Italian name would help propel him to fame. The new Tony hit the streets with relentless optimism and an unstoppable determination. He went to every music venue and promoter he could find, auditioning for singing gigs, but found little success. Still, a few promoters liked his enthusiasm. To throw him some work, they let him in on deals for other musical acts. Tony soon found he was a capable promoter in his own right. He booked singers and bands for venues around L.A. Once he gained a reputation, he started taking advantage of younger, more naive musicians. He won them over with exaggerated claims about his success. Then, once the artist put him in charge of negotiating rates with the venue, he lied about how much money they were due and took the difference for himself. He then used this money to invest in a few small businesses throughout the city, like health studios, restaurants, and bars. And if money got tight, he sold copyrighted songs without the artist's permission. One young singer fully convinced by Tony's big talk was Helen Hagen. She fell head over heels for him, and they married in 1961, when he was 27 and she was in her early 20s. But they both had inflated ideas about their chances at stardom. When successful careers failed to materialize for either of them, their marriage suffered. Tony started to cheat on Helen. He baited her into arguments, raging at her whenever it suited him. He blamed his lack of success on her. According to therapist Adam Jukes, misogyny like Tony's has its roots in the concept of masculinity itself. He said, culture and society are the seedbed where the child's misogyny takes root. The construction of the woman as the carer is all around us, and that is part of what informs men's rage with women. Tony later wrote about this time in his life. I had absolutely no respect for women at all. I actually hated them and decided that for some reason I had been put here to punish them because they were so evil. Yet, in May of 1964, after they had been married for three years, Tony and Helen had a son, Mark Anthony Hoffman. Tony was 29 by this time, and his main source of income was as a vice president of a chain of health studios. They were fad-like gyms, also offering services like massages and dance classes. The side project investment had unexpectedly blossomed into a major moneymaker, and so it dominated Tony's day-to-day. Still, he continued to promote musical acts when he could stay connected to the business. 
He became obsessed with portraying the trappings of wealth, renting limos, and wearing expensive suits and sunglasses. His tendency to overspend could be connected to narcissism, which goes hand in hand with his misogyny. Professor Susan Krauss Whitborn wrote, Narcissistic men's tendency to take risks reflects a desire to get attention, but also to overcome feelings of shame and emptiness. The aggressiveness they can also show stems from feeling that their self-esteem is threatened. This makes sense, as Tony was never more misogynistic and insecure than when Helen brought up their finances. When she asked Tony to limit his spending, he got defensive and screamed at her repeatedly. They separated soon after Mark was born, in 1964. Within months, Tony was living with another aspiring actress, Judy Lee Stearns, who also quickly became pregnant. The health studios started to falter, and the additional expenses required to support his newborn son started to pile up. But Tony was undaunted. He continued to live an extravagant life. He cruised local bars and music venues, searching out new talent and connections for his music promotion. By now, Tony's accountant was calling him daily, asking for a meeting to talk about his out-of-control spending. He ignored the calls. One day in late 1964, Tony climbed into the back of a rented limousine he couldn't afford on the way to a meeting with an investment firm. He needed money for his latest campaign promoting a slew of new musical acts. What he would find instead was destiny. What follows is Tony's personal version of events. He arrived at the firm and sat down in a large conference room, ready for a long day of haggling with potential investors. But when he opened his mouth to greet the investors, no words came. His vision grew dim. He realized he couldn't hear the crowd around him. Was he having a heart attack? Was he going insane? Tony later wrote, I looked at the people in the room. Some of their mouths were moving, but I could not hear anything they were saying. Suddenly I heard a voice, a voice that came down from every direction. It was all around me. It was going through every fiber of my being. The voice said, I am the Lord thy God. Stand up on your feet and tell the people in this room that Jesus Christ is coming back to earth, or thou shalt surely die. Tony looked around to see if someone was teasing him. No one else was reacting to the voice. He thought he was going insane. In his own words, people had told me I was a genius, and geniuses often cracked up, so that was it. He stood up and told the bewildered investors he was feeling ill. Before he could finish the sentence or leave, something forced him back into his seat. He heard the booming voice again. Stand up on your feet and tell the people that Jesus Christ is coming back, or thou shalt surely die. Tony stood a second time and took a single, tremulous step. His heart beat through his chest. He felt dizzy and numb, like his soul had been ripped from his body. He screamed in his mind, promising the voice he would do whatever it wanted. By now, everyone in the conference room stared at him. Tony felt the warmth return to his body and his breathing calm. Confused and scared, he tried to steady himself. He looked at the people around him and said, I know you won't believe me, but God is telling me to tell you that Jesus Christ is coming back to earth. The rest of the room stared at him, unsure of how to act. Tony felt the breath being sucked from his lungs again. The voice asked, is that the best you can do? He was suddenly certain that if he didn't do more, the entire world would disintegrate in front of him. But he was raised Jewish. He didn't know anything about Jesus. So he did the only thing he did know how to do, perform. His limbs were stiff and hard to control. He staggered forward and knocked over a Rolodex, sending cards flying across the room. He asked everyone to drop to their knees and give up their evil ways. He yelled for everyone in the room to repent. Then, according to Tony, he felt the Lord's presence fade. The room grew brighter and his faculties returned. The investors threatened to call the police. Tony convinced them his episode was over, but they still threw him out. Confused and afraid by his sudden epiphany, he ran down the street to the closest church he could find. 
Over the course of the next week, Tony went to every Christian church he knew of to ask about what the Lord said to him, but they told him to keep his prophecies to himself and instead start reading the Bible and attending services. The advice infuriated Tony. He was telling supposed men of God that Jesus was coming back, and they asked him to keep the message to himself? No church he could find was preparing its followers for the imminent day of judgment to his satisfaction. He wondered if he was the only one in the world who knew. With a new purpose, Tony left his job at the health studios and abandoned the planned musical promotion. He was dedicated to serving God, but was also quickly running out of money. Then, one night in 1964, a few months after his first encounter with God, the pressure got to Tony. He paced around his small apartment alone, begging the voice for help. He knew he was destined for something great and asked God to help him take control of his destiny. What was he meant to do? As he fell to his knees by his bed to pray, the lights suddenly grew dim, just like before. The apartment around him melted away, and God showed Tony a vivid vision of hell, a terrible wasteland ringed by bright red flames. Tony could hardly look upon the horror. He called out to God, asking to be saved. Then, heaven appeared to him. He later wrote, I saw myself little, naked, kneeling before God. I was so peaceful I never wanted to leave. I was afraid to open my eyes. I knew if I did, I would be looking into the face of Jesus. When he did open his eyes, he saw a giant cross surrounded by singing angels. He started sobbing and collapsed onto the floor of his apartment, weeping with joy. He was a new man. Tony walked the streets of Hollywood in the pouring rain for hours after that, praying and thinking. He stopped in front of a restaurant and realized how hungry he was. He went inside, soaked to the skin and still wearing his customary dark sunglasses. At the bar, he spotted a platinum blonde woman sitting next to a girl in her early teens. There was something about the woman Tony couldn't resist. He approached the bar, sat down next to her, and introduced himself. She told him her name was Susan Fleetwood, and the girl beside her was her daughter, Chris. Tony allegedly said, I promote a lot of high-end entertainers, but I haven't seen you before. Susan told him that she'd been an actress for years and that her daughter was a singer. Tony promised Susan that he could make her daughter a big star. He claimed to have promoted the Beatles and Sonny and Cher. In actuality, he hadn't promoted any acts popular enough to even open for the Beatles or Sonny and Cher. While Susan mulled this over, Tony left to go to the bathroom and dry himself off from the rain. Chris told her mother she had heard about this man. Other aspiring stars had fallen victim to his pitch before and told Chris he was a bum who was living with another aspiring actress. Susan was undeterred. She liked the man's confidence and style. She could tell a shark when she saw one. She told her daughter to make herself scarce and not to return to their apartment that night. Though only in her teens, Chris knew what that meant. After Tony returned, she made an excuse and walked out into the rain. As the heavy door closed behind her, she watched her mother caress the man's arm in the smoke-filled room. After Chris left, Susan turned to her new acquaintance. Thinking he might have money, she used one of her favorite hustling lines. She looked him in the eyes and asked, did you know that Jesus Christ is coming back to earth again? Tony looked back at her, stunned. He said, how did you know? They went back to her apartment to talk about it. She later said she baptized him then and there. Within a few months, Tony officially divorced Helen and left Judy Lee Stearns with their newborn son. Tony and Susan saw each other constantly. They read the Bible together and talked about their dreams of stardom. And while Tony was happy and spiritually fulfilled, his business prospects had gone from bleak to non-existent. He tried to redeem himself by taking on new musician clients, but struggled to make any deals. Word about his crazed outburst had circulated widely around town, and he had no choice but to invest more of his time into Susan's ministry, as it was the only thing bringing in money. 
In 1965, when he was 31 and Susan was 40, Tony started officially helping Susan preach. They started recruiting kids off the street and asking that they turn over their earthly possessions to be saved. It was the end of the early hippie movement and two years before the famous Summer of Love. Counterculture youths wandered the streets of Hollywood, searching for meaning in what they saw as an uncaring world. Widespread use of recreational drugs left many addicted and homeless. Susan and Tony took them in and brought them to their apartment, where they fed and prayed with them. They succeeded in converting a dozen young men and women who eagerly gave what little money they had in exchange for salvation and purpose. These kids were the first foundation of the Alamo's eventual cult following. Itinerant young people made ideal targets. Although they usually lacked disposable income, they brought friends and were eager to spread the word of Jesus' return. There was little chance of reprisal from their parents or the police because the majority of the kids were runaways. By mid-1966, they had collected close to 30 members. Many slept on the floor of the apartment and passed their meager paychecks or government assistance checks directly to Susan and Tony. In August of 1966, Tony and Susan celebrated the growth of their cult by going to Las Vegas with money from their followers. While there, they got married. Their destinies now intertwined. The Alamos turned their attention to their finances. The situation was dire. Despite his continuing efforts, Tony's promotional career had failed to rebound. Susan now took in the majority of their money through her ministry. But that still wasn't much. A few months after their marriage, the pair decided to go back to Vegas and try their luck recruiting there. Tony and Susan told their eager followers to get jobs and send them money by mail so the foundation could grow in Nevada and to continue to spread the word that the second coming was imminent. Chris intended to stay behind in California, but without Susan's support, she floundered. A few weeks after Tony and Susan left, she followed them to Vegas. Things started out okay. In his first few months in Nevada, Tony made a surprising number of contacts with his aggressive charm and signed a promising young singer named Ruvon. But after Chris had been in Las Vegas for a couple of weeks, Tony began to act strange. One afternoon, while Susan was out of the apartment, Tony did something so horrible Chris would remember it for the rest of her life. Coming up, Tony's actions become abusive and ruin the relationship between Susan and Chris. Now, back to the story. In 1966, Susan Alamo's 16-year-old daughter, Chris, had just moved in with her mother and 32-year-old new stepfather, Tony Alamo, in Las Vegas. Chris had been living in Los Angeles and missed her mom but was coming to regret her decision to visit the newlyweds. Chris had never warmed up to Tony, and now that he and Susan were married, he tried to get close to her. His advances made her increasingly uncomfortable. One day while the two were alone, Tony sexually assaulted her. Susan walked in during the act, but refused to believe her daughter that Tony was the aggressor. She accused Chris of lying and trying to steal Tony away. Chris left Las Vegas and flew back to Los Angeles, broken and alone. Psychologist Brandy Engler provided some insight into why the other woman is so often the target of blame rather than the cheater. She wrote, It's easier to turn to rage and a desire to attack another person than it is to deal with shame. Women have historically been a target for social anxieties, by the way. Think witch-burning, stoning, etc., So, to avoid the shame of being betrayed by her new husband, and to avoid the reality that Tony was a rapist, Susan decided to attack the easy target instead. The Alamos returned to Los Angeles a few months after Chris in 1967. They were flush with cash from backers of the singer Ruvon, but instead of spending the money promoting the singer, Tony and Susan bought themselves expensive clothing and jewelry. Once they returned, Susan called her daughter out of the blue and invited her to lunch. Chris hadn't intended on ever speaking to her mother again, but was in the midst of hard times and couldn't turn down a free meal. 
Chris was shocked to see Tony and Susan dressed to the nines at their meeting. She later said, I go to meet them and he's wearing an unborn calf coat, the most disgusting thing I've ever seen. She's got some new diamonds and she's looking good. I said, who'd you kill? Susan laughed and explained their scheme with the opera singer. They collected exorbitant rates for booking Ruvant's concerts, but paid the singer only a fraction of what they received. Then, Susan told Chris she forgave her daughter for everything she did. Chris was incensed that her mother was still sticking up for Tony, but without any income of her own, she had little choice except to move back in with them. In customary fashion, the Alamos burned through their money quick. Then, when Ruvan discovered their scam, the gravy train halted. Susan and Tony turned back to their ministry for financial support. They were forced to start almost from scratch. All but a few of their previous followers had left while they were in Vegas for months. Tony and Susan pulled in new converts more aggressively than ever before. They even converted Chris's friends, starting with her new boyfriend, Ed. Ed lived in a small house with a dozen artists and musicians. Susan believed that after converting a few of them, the rest would follow and spread the word among the wider Bohemian artist community. According to Chris, Susan had Ed praying for forgiveness in under 10 minutes. The Alamos held services twice a day in their tiny apartment. After Tony played a few hymns on his guitar, Susan delivered an hour-long sermon highlighting the upcoming Armageddon and stressing the importance of proselytizing as much as possible. According to Susan, time was of the essence. People needed to be saved from the corrupting influence of drugs and mainstream religions, which didn't take the rapture seriously. After the service, dinner was served. To attract hungry converts, the Alamos scavenged dumpsters to make meals for new marks. Many recruits only agreed to come in the first place in exchange for a hot meal. Susan and Tony's job was to keep them coming back. Susan often threatened potential converts with hell laying out the consequences of a lack of faith. If she was wrong about Jesus' return, then no one was hurt and she was still happy. But if they were wrong, they would face eternal torment in hell on earth. Belief was the safer bet. For people who lived precarious lives and were already unhappy with the choices they had made, it was a persuasive argument that played into their anxieties. Susan further inflamed their fears by pointing out the increasing pollution around Los Angeles, the threat of earthquakes, and the war in Vietnam. 30 minutes with Susan could turn the most carefree kid into a worried bundle of nerves, willing to pay any price for safety and salvation. Tony took a more optimistic approach, playing to his audience's hopes instead. He presented himself as a humble man touched by God. He told the street kids they were the chosen ones, here to put the world on a righteous path. Once they collected their converts, Susan and Tony did everything they could to cement them into the fold. In 1968, they set strict schedules of praying and proselytizing for their approximately 50 followers. Tony and Susan micromanaged Foundation members until they were afraid to do or try anything they weren't explicitly instructed to do. Sometimes the Alamos ordered members to change their taste in music or appearance with no apparent justification other than exerting control. According to psychologist Tim Carey, the goals of bullies, dictators, and overbearing acquaintances tends to be about the right way that other people should think or act or speak or dress or be. The wills of the members were worn down by persistent demands and intimidation. When they disobeyed, they were bullied with threats of godly retribution and hell. The Alamos also developed a tight system for extorting money from their acolytes as their ministry grew. On a set schedule, they sent the youths out to collect welfare checks. They even gave the kids crash courses on the most efficient ways to secure government cheese. A favorite tactic of the Alamo youths was to go to the welfare office and pretend to be high on LSD. According to Chris, they would act half-crazed and confused until the employees would get fed up and write them a check to make them go away. To make the followers even further dependent on them, 
Tony and Susan ruled that living by yourself or keeping any of your own money was considered a sinful act. Instead, they all moved into a house in Hollywood, six blocks from Sunset Strip. The followers slept on the floor, without beds and sometimes without pillows. By 1969, 35-year-old Tony and 44-year-old Susan had collected almost 100 followers. Through their various schemes, the followers gave them the equivalent of over $10,000 every month. The Alamos decided to take the next step toward expanding their operations. They filed Articles of Incorporation in late 1969, making the Alamo Christian Foundation an official corporation. Tony had completely given up on his music promotion by now. The foundation was far more lucrative. He and Susan both made sure to emphasize their place at the forefront of the ministry. They were second only to God, who, of course, spoke to them alone. Their followers began referring to them as Elder Tony and Elder Susan. Whenever they approached the pulpit in their house, they expected a reverent hush to fall over the congregation. Susan gave most of the sermons. She organized the prayers and scheduled the services, while Tony handled the music. He sang hymns with the backing of a small choir. The foundation received a further financial boost in late 1969, thanks to the infamous Manson family murders that year. The event shocked many straight-laced Christian Americans, who were now worried that hippie satanic cults could influence their children to commit unholy acts. The Alamos turned these fears to their advantage. They bought a small bus and painted doomsday messages on the side, such as, The world is coming to an end. Are you ready to meet God? On weekends, the Alamos crammed as many of their young followers as they could into the bus and camped out in different church parking lots. They held homemade signs and aggressively pitched the foundation to passers-by on their way into the churches. They highlighted the precarious lives of their followers. In the words of Susan's daughter, Chris, they delivered this message about how, Look at this. We brought this bunch of crazy kids. I'm keeping them from coming around like Charles Manson did and cutting your throat. I brought them to the Lord. Sympathetic and fearful parents didn't often join the foundation themselves, but they did donate in droves in response to the Alamo's fear-mongering. These tactics brought in the money necessary for the organization to continue expanding. Even with Susan and Tony's typical reckless spending on themselves, the vast number of followers donating their full welfare checks every month allowed the foundation to continue accumulating wealth. There was never a shortage of directionless young adults on the streets who were eager to believe they were chosen for something greater. As the organization grew, it only seemed more impressive and legitimate to those looking in from the outside. Despite the aggressive conversion tactics of its members, the foundation generally avoided condemnation because of their outward appearance as a Christian organization, albeit an apocalyptic one. And because they targeted vulnerable street kids, for the most part, the Alamos were free to do what they wanted to their followers without fear of reprisal from the parents of the children they recruited. By 1970, the foundation had soared to new heights, with close to 200 members, too many to pack into their Los Angeles house, and too many to keep track of without a complicated infrastructure. So 36-year-old Tony and 45-year-old Susan set out to secure their control. Their first and most important move was to buy a large tract of land about an hour from Los Angeles in Saugus, California. It was paramount all the followers lived under one roof. The move also helped protect them from prying eyes. Neighbors around their Los Angeles home had started to complain in recent months about the noise and massive numbers of hippies wandering around the neighborhood. Tony and Susan wanted to stay under the radar as much as possible to avoid outside criticism. Saugus was a small town surrounded by mountains and canyons. The Alamo's 160 acres of land was mostly undeveloped, but did include a large building, which was once a restaurant. Susan and Tony put their followers to work refurbishing the place. 
the young men and women cleared some land for cultivation, repurposed the restaurant into a church, and built a house to serve as Tony and Susan's place of residence, with a room for Chris as well. A year later, in 1971, the land was unrecognizable. The new church featured a towering steeple. A luxurious farmhouse was constructed for the revered elders of the church. They grew cotton and vegetables in the fields. Laborers were paid nominally, but expected to donate their entire paychecks back to the church in exchange for meals, lodging, and spiritual enrichment. The Alamos finally had a place all to their own, but rather than rest on their accomplishments, they sought to expand their foundation even further. They redoubled their conversion efforts and established protocol for bringing new people into the fold. The new guidelines focused on isolating the subjects as quickly as possible and pressuring them into stressful situations. Once they convinced a kid on the streets of Hollywood to visit their new compound with the promise of a free meal, they loaded them onto a bus, driving them 50 miles away from the city. A longtime follower was assigned to each new potential convert. Starting on the ride to Saugus, the converts were separated from any friends or family who had boarded the bus along with them. As psychologist Dr. Lisa Fontes points out, Isolation is also a key tactic of domestic abusers. She wrote, Isolation made the women vulnerable to further coercive control. Abusers tend to monitor their partner's contacts and strategically act charming and helpful so people cannot imagine the cruel acts occurring behind closed doors. Suddenly separating people from family and friends left them more vulnerable to suggestion. In a new place surrounded by new people and without the support of their friends, many were nervous and more apt to make impulsive decisions, like surrendering their possessions and spirituality to the Alamos. After the bus ride to Saugus, the followers were shown around the grounds of the compound. They were given a meal made from donations the Alamos got from a sympathetic local supermarket. Next, potential converts were taken to church for a service led by Elder Tony and Elder Susan. Existing followers planted in the congregation gave heartwarming testimonials about how the Alamos had converted them and changed their lives. By the end of the process, it was usually late in the evening. Rather than taking the bus back to the dark streets of Hollywood, many people decided to accept the Alamo's invitation and stay at the compound overnight. After all, what was the harm in staying a day or two? The problem was, once you started life on the compound, it was hard to leave. The bus only left on a specified schedule, and new members weren't allowed out without an escort. On the morning after their initial tour, new followers were watched like hawks. Any time a recruit broached the subject of leaving, they were hounded by hardcore members, begging them to stay. They were threatened with eternal torment and made to feel guilty for taking advantage of the Foundation's generosity. With everything Elder Tony and Elder Susan had provided, would they really turn their backs on them now? Soon enough... They were cowed into surrender. Of course not. They would never leave. Ever. Thanks again for tuning in to Cults. We'll be back with part two on the Alamo Christian Foundation next Tuesday. We'll see how the Alamo Christian Foundation expanded its operations through increasingly exploitative tactics and the dramatic events that led the FBI to their door. For more information on Tony Alamo and his foundation, amongst the many sources we used, we found Debbie Shriver's book, Whispering in the Daylight, The Children of Tony Alamo Christian Ministries and Their Journey to Freedom, extremely helpful to our research. And as always, you can find more episodes of Cults, as well as all of podcasts, other shows on Spotify or in your favorite podcast directory. Several of you have asked how to help us. If you enjoy the show, the best way to help is to leave a five-star review. And don't forget to follow us on Facebook and Instagram at Parcast and Twitter at Parcast Network. We'll see you next time. 
Cults was created by Max Cutler, is a production of Cutler Media, and is part of the Parcast Network. It is produced by Max and Ron Cutler, sound designed by David Turk, with production assistance by Ron Shapiro and Paul Mahler. Additional production assistance by Maggie Admire and Freddie Beckley. This episode of Cults was written by Terrell Wells and stars Greg Polson and Vanessa Richardson. Hi, listeners. It's Ashley Flowers, and here's a quick reminder to check out my new true crime limited series, International Infamy. Every Tuesday, I'm taking you across the globe to look at 15 of the most notorious crimes from 15 different countries. Some stories are sure to shock. Some may leave you stumped but all are quite the trip. Follow my new series, International Infamy with Ashley Flowers. Listen for free on Spotify or wherever you get your podcasts.